He's gone to organize the union. But working men. I want to welcome all of our jazz speakers from uh, the faith union movement, the historians, the journalists, workers, musicians, and writers who are participating in this very special event celebrating a century of workers in struggle, 1913 to 20. And I want to very especially commend Seanador David Cullinan and the Sinn Féin Organising Committee who put a huge amount of time and effort into this event. <laughs> I just to reflect back to Dublin, 1913, a city of grinding poverty and exploitation. Infant mortality was among the highest in the world. Thousands of families lived in single rooms in crumbling tenement houses. Workers had no rights. They were hired and fired at the whim of employers. The children of workers had no childhood and no future. They often worked from a very, very young age. In my home city of Belfast, a that time female and child labour predominated in the linen mills. Other citizens lived in more in appalling conditions in the docks, the shipyards, and in casual labour. In 1911, James Connolly was appointed Belfast organiser of the Irish Transport and General Workers Union. And he organised the workers of Belfast and especially the linen slaves. He described their conditions. Many Belfast mills are slaughterhouses for the women and the penitentiaries for the children. With clothes drenched with water and hands torn and lacerated as a consequence of the speeding up of the machinery, a qualified spinner in Belfast receives a wage less than some of our highest mill owners would spend weekly upon a dog. My argument was also part of the British Empire. Imperact the togda or druk eji of his army you side and Kedja Million Dini. As part of the empire as a colony, Ireland was used and exploited and abused in the interest of British capitalism. And with our long history of struggle for freedom records, in every generation Irish men and women have opposed British government involvement on this island. But Republicans and Nationalists weren't alone. The early trade unions of the 1700s Combinations of skilled and unskilled workers, like the Belfast Cabinet Makers Club, the regular carpenters of Dublin, the ancient corporation of carpenters of Cork, and others stood in defiance of those who sought to exploit their members. And it's no surprise that the first anti-union laws were introduced here in the 1700s and 1720s. But it also has to be acknowledged that colonialism and discriminatory industrial development, primarily in the Lagan Basin around Belfast, and the use of sectarian politics led to an early division among Irish trade unionists with the creation of both Irish-based and British-based trade unions. In 1894, the year in which the Trade Unions Congress was established, there were 51 Irish-based unions with a total membership of 11,000. British-based unions had a similar number of members. But for all trade unionists, the 1913 lockout is the tipping point in modern Irish labour history. Workers and their families and their union found themselves in a pitched battle against the political, economic and media establishment of their day. Led unsurprisingly by the independent group of newspapers. When the Irish Transport and General Workers Union succeeded and recruiting workers in the Dublin United Tramways, the company proceeded to dismiss all known union members. The Dublin bosses demanded that employees across hundreds of workplaces sign a pledge never to join or to associate with the ITGWU. However, in what was a remarkable display of solidarity, thousands of workers refused to sign and were dismissed as one after another places of work closed their gates to union members. The employers had the backing of the British authorities in Dublin Castle and of the Dublin Metropolitan Police. 
And during the months of the lockout, police and workers fought running battles when the DMP moved against them. James Nolan and John Byrne were killed. And on August the 13th, the British authorities banned a mass meeting in O'Connell Street when that was savagely attacked, giving us the first bloody Sunday of the 20th century. And one consequence of that was the formation of the Irish Citizens' Army. The end of the lockout in early 1914 was inclusive, but the result was not. Poverty forced strikers back to work, but far from breaking the trade union movement, the lockout saw it consolidate its strength and significantly grow in the following decades. The central issue in that dispute was the right to join a union, to organise and to be able to engage in collective bargaining. It was about the right of workers to be treated decently and fairly. Now, regrettably, this problem still persists. Jero and Ye and Lockout, Hog O'Connell, Augustina Ella and Aram Saranok, a Gudge Polichiacht, a Gudge Socialactus, a Gudge San Olus, a Skak Buji Narankona, a B. A. Planoi, Radloid. After the lockout, Colony brought uh, the men and women of the Citizens Army to be part of the raising and to work with those who were planning uh, a raising. And he understood clearly the connection between the national and the social. They're both opposite sides of the one coin. And he famously linked the cause of Ireland with the cause of labour. He was a fierce opponent of plans for partition and he argued quite correctly that it would create a carnival of reaction. Conley and Pierce and the other leaders of 1916 presented a vision of a different Ireland, and that's to be found in the words of the proclamation. And for me, these should be the guiding principles for workers and republicans and socialists and democrats today. It's anti sectarian, it embraces every Irish citizen, it declares the right of the people of Ireland to the ownership of Ireland, it guarantees religious and civil liberties, equal rights, equal opportunities and to cherish all the children of the nation equally. And these are great words and great ideas. They're a promise to every citizen on this island that he or she can share in the dignity of humankind as equals, with full opportunity, that we can enjoy freedom, educate our children, provide for our families and live together with tolerance and respect for each other. However, the two states imposed after 1916 failed to deliver these principles. Both have been characterised by economic failure, by immigration, by backwardness on social issues, by inequality and by the failure to protect the most vulnerable of our citizens. Those who built this state turned their backs on the people in the north. And they turned their backs also on the ideas of independence and a genuine republic. The southern state that developed was on hock to the Catholic hierarchy while the six counties became a Protestant state for a Protestant people in which structured political and religious discrimination was endemic. Now, that's the background and the foreground in which the labour movement has had to work over the last 18 years and over that last 100 year period. And I think when we reflect back on that on the two conservative states ruled by conservative elites in their own very narrow interests. The old colonial system replaced by a system of neo-colonialism. So it's been a difficult 100 years for working people and for the trade union movement. Conditions in the North saw an emergence of a trade unionism which many Republicans and nationalists and progressives viewed as largely ineffective. And there are exceptions. Among them was my friend and our comrade Ains McCormick, who died recently. And Ains was an exceptional trade union activist and a former president, the only woman president of the ICTU. She took part in the civil rights campaign in the 60s. She was an internationalist. She was a strong advocate for equality and for women's rights. And she chaired, just about this time last year, uh, a Sinn Féin United Ireland conference in Derry. And when Lucy Lido asked her what she wanted to be described as, she said, as a woman activist. So she not just 
She didn't just speak out against discrimination, she actively campaigned against it. She supported the McBride principles for fair employment. She played a key role in the peace process and for one I found her advice on equality and anti-discrimination measures crucial in the Good Friday Agreement negotiations. So she was a remarkable woman, was Agnes McCormick, and I know she will be missed by everyone in this hall. In this state, workers' rights have not been protected or advanced as they should. 100 years after the lockout, this state is only one of three EU member states in which workers have no legislative right to workplace representation. No right to sit across from their employers and to negotiate the terms and conditions of their employment. Workers in this state have no legislative right to collective bargaining. And when Sinn Féin introduced an employment rights bill into the law last May, it was to provide adequate safeguards for workers, including to enhance the period of notice for workers who are being made redundant and to expedite the hearing and processing of claims to entitlements. The government said that this was unnecessary. The Labour and <coughs> Fine Gael TDs voted against what we were trying to do. Now, let anybody here in this hall or those other people out there in the sticks tell us that these measures are unnecessary. Never at this time of recession are workers' rights and the legislative entitlement to those rights more necessary. As we look forward then to what needs to be done in the upcoming period, it is worthwhile reflecting on the recent negotiations. Now, the government commenced those negotiations into the extension to the Cook Park Agreement by saying that they would legislate and they would bring in uh, measures to cut uh, people's pays and entitlements. Now, that, that obviously and understandably opened up a dilemma for trade union leaders. And the question being posed is, is the outcome of these recent negotiations better than the one which would have been produced in a government legislated pay adjustment? Now clearly some think that it is. And that means that they have little confidence in this government. And while that may well be a given about Fine Gael, what does this lack of confidence say about the relationship of the wider Labour movement with the Labour Party? What is the point of Labour in government that it is not about protecting workers and working families and promoting equality? And what say, 100 years later, does the wider Labour movement have in these matters? Now, these are difficult times. Sinn Féin understands that. We also understand tactics and strategy and compromise. But all of these strategies, tactics and compromises need continuously contextualised in our vision for the future, our core values, our objectives, so that decisions on these issues advance that vision, advance our core values and our objectives. If we fail to do that, then we risk losing our way. Now, losing our way can be temporary, it may be a disaster if we can be alert enough to find our way again quickly before we lose any sense or all sense of what we're about and where we are going. But we have to, all of us, be constantly mindful of who we are, of where we come from, of what we stand for, and where we want to go. And so too with the Labour movement. The working people of this island, and I include workers from the unionist constituency, need to hear a very clear, principled alternative to the right-wing ideology which underpins many of our political and media institutions. There is a battle of ideas to be won and an alternative to be forged. And surely the leaders of organised labour and the trade unions have a role and a duty to be part of this. Austerity is not working. The government has alternatives, it has other options. It could have brought in a wealth tax. It could have introduced a third band of tax on those earning more than 100,000. Instead, it is ordinary workers who bear the burden again and again 
and the game. And that is not fair. So public service workers will decide your position on the Crook Park proposal, and that is a decision that you will come to, and we wish you well in those deliberations. But whatever the outcome, it is important that you know that the trade union movement today is needed more than ever in the Ireland of the 21st century. And workers, and I include the unemployed, are looking to their respective unions for leadership and hope and solidarity in the difficult times ahead. Ask workers from Waterford Crystal, be the Cortex, Visteon, Lagged Brick, Vodafone, Game, Lazenza, the Azio, HMB, and many, many others of their rights as workers are protected. And of course they are. So, we have to make a stand on these issues. And we have to stand together. In York, go her behaviour. I want to welcome to this conference workers from some of those workplaces, workers from Bastion, from Waterford Crystal, from Lagan Brick, and from Viva Cortex. And their courage over a long protracted period is an example and an inspiration. To remember that a quarter of our young people are unemployed, 27% youth unemployment, that 87,000 emigrated in 2011, and that's continuing in the current uh, time. So there's lots of work to be done in the upcoming period. Let us remember also during the, the boom of the Celtic Tiger when people like Sinn Féin and others put forward proposals tackle inequality, to invest in sustainable jobs and social housing and infrastructure and hospitals, the doubles did it But when the bubble burst, there was an immediate move to socialise the debt and to force the disadvantaged and those with low and middle incomes and other citizens to carry the burden. So there is a right-wing elite out there, and it sees recession as an opportunity not to be missed, to drive down wages, to sack workers, to undermine people's terms and conditions. I hope in the course of our discussions uh, today that all of those issues will be touched on. Uh, throw our Sinn Féin away, Cambridgeshire, and Scotland, Shaw, or throw our Sinn Féin, Shasun, Lipshire. This event today is part of our contribution to the centenary of events that mark the second decade of the 20th century. And I wish you all well. I want to, if I may, just uh, single out Brian O'Donnell, who, who represents my Una from the States and who travelled here to be with us. So, get your culture and support. Over Sin Misha, I uh, mixed up the chronology of my pages, which is why I had to get my portion to look at that speech. But uh, on a good day, uh, it is uh, an important conference, and hopefully it will be part of the process of ongoing engagement. Because if ever Ireland and the working people